everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Journey Yes Nebraska series. I'm Kelly Robert. I'm the Journey Program Manager, and I always forget my manners if I wait until the end of these things. So I want to thank Caitlin Moore, who is always my right-hand woman as far as registration, Zoom, all things IT. In fact, today she's coming to us from a parking lot, but that's another story. And Nikki Davison, marketing coordinator extraordinaire who helps with these things. This is the second in the Yes Nebraska series. And this series takes a deeper look at Nebraska's history, love of the arts, and more importantly, the people behind the scenes that work so tirelessly to make sure that we have just this plethora of arts and history to enjoy. You know, that's one of the neat things about our culture here. And there are just some incredible people to talk to. And we set out to do just that. Today's guest was to be Dr. Jean Lukesh, who has, has written numerous textbooks and other books. Dr. Lakesh had an emergency and was not able to join us today. She recommended someone that I know you're going to enjoy every bit as much. It's an esteemed colleague of hers. Her name is Nancy Carlson. And if you've ever heard of the Genoa Indian School and living here, well, you have. If, then you know of Nancy's work. Um, Nancy received her master's degree in anthropology and archaeology from UNL. She's an alumni from UNL and has been working on archaeology projects within the state of Nebraska. Nancy's main area of interest is in collecting and preserving the history of the Genoa U.S. Indian School. After visiting with former students in the 1980s, Nancy helped promote the founding of the Genoa Indian School Foundation and is a charter member. Nancy organized the annual reunion celebration starting in 1990 and has been doing this for the last 30 years. Wow. Since the Indian School Center is an all-volunteer organization, it has taken years to try to locate and collect the school's and students' information and is an ongoing project. This endeavor has given healing to many of the former students and helps to educate their descendants and the general public. Nancy and her husband, Jerry Carlson, are co-owners of the Kiki Hockey. I knew I was going to butcher that, but you can tell us about it. Kiki Hockey Hills Farm and Contract archaeology, growing corn, soybeans, grapes, asparagus, yum, and shiitake mushrooms. Jerry has been growing Native American corn for the Pawnee Seed Preservation Project for more than 10 years. They are both life members of the UNL Alumni, Alumni Association, Nebraska State Historical Society, and Genoa U.S. Indian School Foundation and on its board of directors. With that, there is so much more to say. I'm going to let Nancy say it. So take it away, Nancy. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. And I wanted to thank Kelly and everyone for allowing me to um, present today. I'm going to share my screen with the PowerPoint. And uh, there he is. Yeah. Just a moment and we will start. Oops, I wanna go back one. There. The, um, again, thank you Kelly for inviting me. And I have been working with the Indian school for the last 31 years. In this photograph can see that they were marching, the boys were marching. It is the large boys dormitory. And back here in the back was the manual training building, which today is the uh, interpretive center. 
But before we get into the school, I want to give you a little background information on the Genoa area. The Pawnee lived in Nebraska since the 1600s and consisted of four bands. It was the Skitty or the Wolf Band, the Pitlaharit or Tappage Band, the Chowie or Grand Band, and the Kickahockey or the Republican Bands. And these different bands lived apart along the Loop, the Platte, and the Republican Rivers here in Nebraska. But later on, due to the many attacks by Sioux and other groups that were moving into the area, the four bands decided to see their, they went in on a, um, on a treaty and they ceded all of their land except what is now Nance County for their reservation. And you can note the unusual shape of Nance County because the Pawnee requested 30 miles along the loop and have a 15 mile wide band. And that is their, was their reservation and it is now Nance County. The four bands moved to the reservation village in 1859 where they built 200 of these earth lodges and there were 3,500 Pawnee living there. This village was on the south side of Beaver Creek. But now I wanna take a step back for two days and say the Pawnee had established the town of Genoa in 1857 as a way station for the Mormon handcarts on their trek west. So in 1859, the agent wanted their buildings and the mill and forced the Mormons out. So there was a two year period in there where the Mormons were living. We're back here at the Pawnee village at the, during the reservation period. This is a close, this is a, well, just a moment. This is a close up of the Jackson photo from 1871. And you can note the teepee poles that are leaning against the entryway to the Earth Lodge. As a part of the treaty, the Pawnee requested that a school be built so their children would be able to read and write. And so in 1866, the brick schoolhouse was built. It was located a mile from the large Pawnee village and it's right back here. I don't know if you can see with my marker, that's where the school was at. The school was in operation when the Pawnee were removed to Oklahoma. I find this an interesting school photo showing that the children were able to bring their, their ax and they can hang out of the window. I just think it's a pretty cool photo. So what did the Pawnee School have to do with the Federal Boarding School as shown in this 1911 photo? When the federal government developed the policy to use federal boarding schools to civil civilize native children, they held title to the Pawnee School building with 320 acres of land and all the reservations were at least several days rides away from Genoa. So it became the fourth federal boarding school and it started with 71 Sioux children in 1884. The object of the school was to quote, Native American children and assimilate them into white society by taking them from their families and their tribes and teaching them English, reading, writing, arithmetic, and a trade. The students went to class for half of a day and then they learned a trade for half a day. And you can see the students standing in the background here. That was because for photograph day, they took all the students that went to school to class in that room. So those standing up were probably in the afternoon class. One of the hardest things for the children was that they could only speak English and were punished for speaking their own language. Unfortunately, this has resulted in many tribes losing their language. They marched everywhere. Students who were later in the army said that was great training for the army. And in fact, 27 students were in the 35th Infantry Division in World War II from this school. 
Male students were taught harness making, and we actually, we have a replica of Edward Hatchett's harness making diploma. And he, Edward did not like his time at the Genoa School, but he took what he learned there and used it to provide for his family because he took that diploma into a bank and was able to get the first business loan for the Winnebago uh, reservation. And so he was able to start a business there and provide for his family. Male students also learned animal husbandry, which included showing livestock at several state fairs and winning many prizes. They learned blacksmithing, which is shown here, gardening and other trades. Female students were taught nursing. And you can note the hospital at the bottom, which was often very full. And they learned housekeeping. Also sewing and cooking. Can you imagine cooking? There was in 1932, there were 599 students. So they would have had to cook enough food for all of them. The students, as I said before, they attended half a day and learned the trade the other half. It was a good thing. They sewed their own clothes and grew their own food. Otherwise, they would have been in very dire straits as the federal government only paid $167 a year per student to feed, clothe, educate, and house them. It was also often called gravy school because they were served lots of gravy. There were numerous activities, including track, baseball, rodeos, concerts, girls and boy scouts, and musical activities including orchestra and band. The band played at the St. Louis State World's Fair in 1904. Also, two students from the school played in the army band in World War II. The Genoa School closed in 1935 due to a change in the government philosophy and the economic conditions. The Merriam Report was a big influence and with the economic conditions of depression, Reservation schools were developed. The Noah facility was given to the state of Nebraska, which used it as a penal farm, shown here in this 1937 photo, where they're using all of the facilities. This far prison was in operation until 1944, when the state gave the building and the land to the University of Nebraska to be used as a seed farm. In 1951, the university auctioned off most of the buildings. Later, the city of Genoa acquired the manual training building. How did this interpretive center come to be? In 1977, Alan Atkins and the Genoa Historical Board applied to have the school put on the registry of historical places. In 1978, the school was placed on the National Register. The manual training building is pictured in this, build, in this photo, and it is now the Interpretive Center. Other remaining buildings include the barns and some homes, which are all privately owned. Usually, we have an annual celebration the second Saturday of August, and usually the, home, the owner of this barn opens it up and allows tours through, but, but that is usually the only time you can see the inside of this barn. And this was the barn that has many signatures up in the haymow. In the late 1980s, former students came back wondering why they couldn't have a reunion like every other school. So volunteers at the Genoa Historical Board says, well, why not? Well, this was easier said than done as the school had closed 56 years earlier and all the records had been dispersed across the country. Now, at many of the schools, there was usually only three or four Native nations that had their children at the school. And so those records could have gone to those uh, Native tribes. However, the Genoa Indian School had over 40 tribes that sent students here all the way from Maine to California. So how do you find former students after all of this time and no records? 
The students wanting the reunion were asked to spread the word and we did print some things in the newspapers. In 1990, we set the foundation, bought the building, and went in with brooms and scoop shovels. We also put in bathrooms and a handicapped door. We set up the reunion, mainly through word of mouth. You can see how sparse it looks right now with very few items. Dr. Ron Noggle from Wesleyan University and Nancy Sabota Ledford developed a brief history handout for us and helped us with setting up the building. And every year since we have acquired many other items from, and it looks a lot different now. We had what we thought was a good turnout of former students. There were 19, considering that we had very few records. We recorded their memories, but this first year, they didn't speak a lot. However, in following years, they would bring their families and start talking about what happened to them. It was the first time many of them had talked to their families about it. That was the start of the healing process for them. So we have had many healing pro ceremonies. This one is beside the memorial for students who had died at the school. The style and original fence shown here is where students cross the fence to the ball fields or where some also got off the train. Judy Goshkabash, director of the Nebraska Indian Commission, is in this photo. Her mother attended the Genoa School. Irvin Gates was a track student who won a medal at the Nebraska State Meet. However, he had never seen it until one year we got some artifacts from the Nebraska State Historical Society and it was in there. There was not a dry eye in the room when he told about winning it and how much it meant to him to finally hold it. And I'm so glad we had got it that year because he passed away before our next reunion. Through the years, improvements were made to the building. The bricks were soft and the mortar between them had to be dug out by hand. Jerry, my husband and Phil Swantek each volunteered over 700 hours doing that. Uh, at the time we had, uh, our two daughters were in college and they called and said, well, we're not coming home for Thanksgiving this year. Dad will just put me to work help, helping dig out mortar. So it was a nice quiet Thanksgiving. In 2012, we put a new roof on the building courtesy of a Peter Kiewit grant. You can see we put a metal one on where before there was a, a wooden shingles, but we went back through the records and originally it had a metal roof. So we're getting it back to the way it originally was. A scale model of the campus was created as it was in 1920s. There, this, I can get my pointer there. This was the big boys dorm, their shower house, little boys dorm. This was their gymnasium that had an elevated indoor track. Next to it was the um, dining hall, which also served as a chapel. And farther to the east was the big and little girls dorm and the school building. Back up behind here, this large building is um, the hospital. These were married employees' homes. And this was the manual training building, which is now the interpretive center. And back here, there were other barns and buildings for their facilities. And these were also married employees' homes. And this was the administration building. There are over 30 buildings in this complex. The students painted murals in the harness shop and you can see them and compare them to the photo from 1911. They're over 100 years old and they're painted on plaster. So when we went to see about getting them restored at the Ford Center, they couldn't be removed from the wall. So someone would have to come out and the price was prohibitive for us as a volunteer group existing on uh, minimal memberships. There are over 40 flags that honor the students who came from their tribes who attended the school. Now descendants come 
to learn and honor their ancestors. It is a part of the history that most of them didn't know. Physical improvements are important, but data collection and recording is at the heart of the Interpretive Center. We have a research center where the paper records are kept, plus they have been digitized for easier searching. We are very fortunate in the past several years that we have been collaborating with the University of Nebraska at Lincoln and Dr. Margaret Jacobs on a grant that sent grad students to the various national archives to digitize many records that we didn't have. They are now on a website for anyone to search. The web address will be given at the end of this presentation. We also developed a short film to give the history of the school and present questions on the social impacts of the boarding schools. We bring in items from the various tribes to bring parts of their culture back into the center. Here is a painting by a present day Santee Sioux student that is for sale and a quilt made and donated by the Nebraska Indian Community College. Those college students visited and were quite moved by finding about, about their ancestors time at the school. We work with native tribes and the Nebraska Indian Commission to make sure we are honoring the students and not doing anything disrespectful to their cultures. We've been working with the Wolf family to offer a thousand dollar scholarship to the descendant of a former student. Dale Wolf was a student at Genoa and he liked his time at the school. He went on and became an engineer with the NASA space program. He came to most reunions until he passed away. His children now select the recipient of the scholarship. Many of the scholarship recipients have returned to help their native nations. For example, Aaron LaPointe, excuse me, a member of the Winnebago tribe works for the Ho-Chunk Inc. managing their farm interests. Pictured here is Ariel Youngbird, who has gone on several work mission trips to help the, her people. Since we're an all volunteer organization, for us to have money to pay the utilities, insurance, et cetera, we have membership forms. Let's set up an endowment form for the future running of the facility. We also accept donations, memorials, and work on grants. You can find information on membership and donations on our website. And you can see up here, our annual celebration is August 14th this year. And we have speakers come in. We usually have Indian tacos, and we just try to bring out some of the issues that are facing uh, native people today. We are also honored to continue our association with the Pawnee, who still consider Nebraska their homeland and come back for visits. In 2000, the tribe came and presented a powwow. The Pawnee Repatriation Memorial Site is on the east end of the Genoa Cemetery. Here, over 800 Pawnee and their relatives were reburied from museums and institutes to be back in their homeland. Nebraska was the first state to repatriate. This is because the lawmakers who are pushing this law felt that it would be easier to get the law passed based on a unicameral, which Nebraska is the only state that has it, and it did pass. And so all of these people have been repatriated back. And they include six Pawnee Army Scouts and the Indian War markers shown here are for those scouts. Nance County Veterans Memorial and the Genoa Veterans Memorial honors the Pawnee Scouts. Here you can see the Pawnee flag is flying at the Nance County Veterans Memorial. Ricks also honor them as they were the first people recruited to be scouts in the army in 1864 from what is now Nance County. Major North from Columbus led them. There will be a dedication of a highway sign honoring the Pawnee Scouts. We just got selected this year, so it is just going up. The ceremony is in the location of the reservation village in the Genoa Cemetery adjacent to the Pawnee Repatriation Memorial. It will be held June 12th at 
Walter Echohawk, president of the Pawnee Business Council, Pat Leaney Fox, chief of the Skitty Band, and Herb Adson, president of the Pawnee Nation's Cultural Resource Division, will all speak and they are singing and bringing a drum. Everyone is welcome to attend. Just bring your lawn chairs. Here are the websites that I've spoken about. The first one is for the, has the information about actual Indian school. The second one is uh, the, where you can do your research. And we are open through the summer until uh, Labor Day on Saturday from one to five and Sunday from one to four or by appointment. And we have a lot of appointments. And in fact, just this morning, we had a school group go through, just call to make an appointment. As you write down your uh, websites, I'm going to recite a poem to you. Imagine a lonely seven-year-old Lakota boy, hundreds of miles away from a home he left two, three years ago, trying desperately to remember his grandmother's smile and his grandfather's wisdom. Imagine the confusion, the excitement, the horror of 20 different nations blended together in a small school on the prairie. Imagine a new language, a new way of life, some ways good, some ways not. The sounds of 500 children working, learning, playing, marching. Imagine the broken hearts and the broken spirits that will take years to mend. Some will never heal. Imagine not knowing when you see grandfather again, you will not know his words, his stories passed down for generations will be lost to you. You will only understand his tears and he yours. Close your eyes and listen. It all happened here. This was written by my husband, Jerry, after he had met and talked with Sydney Bird, a former student. Now, Sydney was came as quite young age, five or six to the school. At the time, he was living in on the reservation with his grandparents, and they were in very dry, dire straits. So they felt he would be better off going to the school. So they took him into the train station at Valentine, put him on the train with a little tag on his coat that said Genoa Indian School. They got him here to the Indian School, and he said they took him in, they cut all of his hair off, took all of his clothes, and put him in this metal box. Now, he thought they were going to kill him. He had never seen a shower before. But he went on, he, was, he said he was lucky. The house mother took him under her wing and kind of helped him along because most of the boys were quite a bit older than him. He did have a crying tree that he would go out and send under and cry when he needed to. Now, the federal government only had to pay to send a student back home once every three years. Most of the families were able to get the money together to get their students home, their children back home for over the summer. And many of them also got them home over Christmas. But Sydney's grandparents did not have the money to do that. So at the end of three years, he was so excited. He was on the train pulling into the station. He could see grandpa and grandma over there. He was so excited. He went running off the train and then it hit him. He had been young enough when he came. He had forgotten his Lakota language and his grandparents only knew Lakota. He said that was quite a pivotal moment in his life. But when he, um, the good news is he eventually learned the Lakota language he did go back to school. In fact, he actually went on and became a minister. And in his later years, one of his main goals was to teach the, his native language to anyone who would, who would take the time to learn it. And he did teach quite a few people. Uh, we have some wonderful stories of his here. I'm thinking I'm probably kind of short, but I'll take... Um, time to uh, thank you for your interest. And now I guess I can take some questions. 
if anyone has any. Wow. As, as always, you can use the, the chat box to, uh, or the chat feature to ask questions as some of you have already. And Nancy, that was just incredible. Thank you so very much. Um, one, of the, one of the questions was, will this be recorded? They have people they wanna show it to, and yes, yes it will. And just give us a bit of time to get it all, to get it ready. I always do a recap of the entire series and that shows up on our website. Also, the each series as we finish with it or each segment, excuse me, will be on the journey page of the UBT um, web, the journey page of the UBT website. <laughs> that was tripping me up there. And also on our YouTube channel. So that's where that will live. The um, One of the questions, a couple of them have already been answered. Are tours of the school st uh, still possible? Yes, you had told us about yes, the tours. So. The, um, somebody else asked what the annual celebration consists of, and you told us about that. The um, Steve Lindgren had some really complimentary things to say about visiting the Indian school last year as part of the passport program. And they had a very informative guide who did a great job of describing the school, its functions and lifestyle. So that was just a shout out to you. Another question was if Jerry still does brick work. <laughs> he doesn't really want to, <laughs> but no, that kind of cured him, I think. And on a very serious note, Rachel asks, she said, you mentioned children who died at the school. How many children died and how did they pass away? Uh, we don't have an exact count. We do have a memorial board that lists those that we know that did die. Most of those children were sent back to the reservation after they passed away. The children there suffered from various diseases because they were not used to being in such close contact with so many different people. So the hospital was always quite full. Um, a couple that I know about, of course, there were some children that tried to get home that would leave the school. I know one child um, tried to hitch on, hike on to the train, and unfortunately, he got killed doing that. Uh, we, um, we do have other stories. We had an elderly uh, volunteer that was uh, lived north of town with her parents when the school was still in operation. And she recalls a time when um, several of the students stopped by their farm. Her mom and dad um, fed them and just sent them on their way because there were bounties offered if someone would return the children to the school. Otherwise, children who died, um, it was mainly through illnesses. It was they, some of them were just so homesick. It, it's just, you can't believe it, you know, the stories you hear. Heartbreaking. Thank you for sharing that. Nancy, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a bit more about you and Jerry and your growing, you know, from your initial interest in this school and how it grew and, and just the, the, I think we've only scratched the surface as to the, the, your level of commitment to this project. Well, it started out because we felt this need from these former students, but I'll tell you the reason we keep doing it for over 30 years is each one of these students and their families have such interesting stories. And we've met so many really interesting people through doing this. Um, it, we get back and, it, and the focus of the school interpretive center has changed because first we were just trying to tell the story of what actually happened at the school. But now we've evolved into how these things are impacting their descendants and why these things are important. Um, we've had descendants come and they say, well, my grandma always, we couldn't leave the, her house unless our shoes were shined. 
Well, that was one thing that she learned at the school and it, it was just impressed upon her so much that she was doing that to her children. Others said that they, their parents never taught them their language because of course it was drowned out of them at the school. Um, Jerry is, continues, he's for like the past 13 years has grown um, the Pawnee corn for the Pawnee. And so he, they send him the seeds, he grows them and sends it back because they tend to grow better in Nebraska than it does in Oklahoma. And um, so we've gotten to know a lot of really nice people through there. Other Pawnee, Pawnee come up and visit a lot. And um, as an archeologist, I know where a lot of the villages sites were before they were in the reservation village. And so I can take them to some of them and show them these sites and they really enjoy them. Some can say they can hear their ancestors there. So it's, it's just really interesting to do. It sounds like hard work and a lot of really rewarding work. So thank you for that. Another question, Duane would like to know what, what the size of the area was the, where the students came from. What, what size area did they come from and end up most, at the school? Most of them came from the Middle West, but we've, I know of like four or five students that came from Maine. There are like about that many that came from California. A larger amount came from um, New Mexico and Arizona. We had a lot of students come from Michigan and that was because uh, a former student had gone on and gotten his education and became a teacher at the Genoa School. And he went back to his reservation and encouraged a lot of these students to come. But I would say a majority of the students were like from the um, tribes, you know, in South Dakota and Iowa and Nebraska and Kansas that came. The one kind of unusual thing is the Pawnee, you know, this was their homeland, but then they went to Oklahoma. Well, then the first students they brought into the school were Sioux. And you got to understand, the school started right after the Indian War. So the Pawnee didn't want to send their children back up to work with their, to go to school with their enemies. So there wasn't a lot of Pawnee that came back and went to the federal boarding school. And the federal boarding school was, it grew to be 640 acres, but I can see. And the reason they, uh, it, they brought them from farther away, mainly because so they wouldn't be able to get back home and they had to just stay here and learn these things to be assimilated. Wow, okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for, for Nancy? I'm not seeing any more in the, in the chat feature. Nancy, you've been just incredibly informative and you've also tugged at our heartstrings today. Okay. I, um, I, I just can't believe how, how much there's, there's just always so much to know, isn't there? Um, yeah. Oh, I could talk for a long time, but I, I, I try to hit the high points and I just encourage you to come out and also to go on the websites and do a little reading about these students too. We will. And I'm getting lots of thank yous now. They, everybody's saying they learned so much today and thank you so very much. We, um, we hope that everyone can join us next week when our guest will be Bill Steffen from the Lead Center for Performing Arts, talking about the arts in performing arts in Lincoln and, and around Nebraska. Nancy, maybe you can come back next week as a guest and oh. or a, an attendee. And yeah. would you consider joining us again sometime as a presenter? I, I, I will. I will. Um, right. I got to see what my schedule is. I don't have it right in front of me. But I <laughs> yes, I think it should be very interesting. Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you so very much to everyone. Thank you all for taking time out of your day for us. We'll see you next week. And until we meet again, just be well. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone.